I first met Bob in the 70s, 77, I think it would have been, uh, where he was uh, teaching at Stanford. He had graduated, uh, got his PhD from Stanford, and they hadn't quite let him go. And I visited, met Bob, went back to Penn, and said, I think I know who we're about to hire, uh, which we did. And it's been there ever since. Uh, I think I don't need to tell you, I hope I don't need to tell you, that Bob is a leading expert in health communication, and one of the programming center of excellence in cancer communication, I think. I don't want to end now in the second round. But I think the thing that particularly strikes me about Bob and we we uh, sort of alternated in teaching research methods for a long time. And I would uh, have a chance to observe his approach. But particularly like about Bob is that he is extraordinarily good at raising the questions that need to be raised in assessing and evaluating research in thinking about whether or not claims are, are valid. This is particularly important in areas where always scarce resources are being applied to really important problems. It is very easy to assume that something that just makes sense is in fact going to work. It's much more important to find out whether it works because you don't often get to do it again. The resources won't be there. You've, uh, you've wasted an opportunity. I think the ability to put the toughest questions to yourself uh, and to, to research is a really important part of the academic mission. Those of you, and I look around the room, it's most of you uh, who have taught in class have heard me say that the responsibility of academics in research is to play against the house, to make it tough for yourself, not easy. And when I say that, Bob in some ways is my role model. Someone who looks at data and says, make my day. <laughs> I think he'll make our day. Thank you, Larry. Uh, uh, we spent a long time uh, together, and I'm sure I made trouble for you at some point. Or you have me. The, uh, but I'm actually, I, my career has had various phases in it. Uh, and I'm going to talk about stuff I've been thinking about over the last few years more than um, some of my other major areas of work. I spent a long time working in developing countries on uh, both education and nutrition and agriculture and particularly uh, health uh, communication programs. We spent a fair amount of time in the U.S. working on interventions, evaluation of interventions. And I'm actually not going to talk about that very much today. I'm really going to talk about a different area of work, and as you can see, um, it's an area I've been struggling with, trying to make sense of how is it you could possibly make sense out of um, exposure to ordinary media content and really argue it has effects. Now, it's too sensible that it has effects, so it's very tempting for us to just assume that that's true. Um, but the question is, how do you actually make a case for it? Um, so I'm interested in a certain class of media effects. Uh, and others of you will be interested in different classes of media effects. And so this is not a statement about the only good sorts of media effects to look at. It's just what I'm interested in. So um, I'm interested in effects that happen on a large scale. Lots of people, large populations. I'm not interested so much in, in stuff that happens on a small scale in a various way. Um, that occur in, re in real-world context, um, sort of ecologically balanced studies. I, I want to make sure that I'm looking at something that's realistic. Um, and I'm interested in behavior as an outcome, not just cognitions. Um, and so I'm sort of setting myself against these standards, saying you've got to be able to uh, make a case for, for, for research and say, I'm showing effects on real, in a real large-scale context. In developing studies, um, not methods to, ass to assess these effects, I have some rules, some, some assumptions, and I, I'm going to skip over really um, 
uh, a lot of discussion about theoretical mechanisms in this, in this portion of the talk uh, because um, uh, I have almost no data about those mechanisms. And so I could talk about them and say, oh, there are all these mechanisms, but I'm not going to, since I, I don't have much data to test those, I'm not going to talk about them very much. But here's the thing. Um, I'm interested in cumulative effects. That is a repeated exposure over time to lots of sources, not just a single exposure. Um, uh, because my guess is most people, if they're affected by media sources, are affected by repeated exposures over time uh, through multiple sources. So I'm interested in cumulative effects, stuff that adds up. I'm interested a little bit in direct effects. That is, I, I send a message to you, you see it, you, you learn it, you change. But mostly I'm not interested in direct effects. Uh, because I think a lot of the effects we see happen not through um, simple, I see it, I learn it, I do it, but much more through social processing. As our social networks pick them up, they reinforce them, they modify them, they, they reject them. Uh, there's much more of um, a social process through which effects occur, and so we need to be able to study those social processes or allow them to happen if we're going to look at effects. Similarly, effects may occur through um, institutional uh, processes. That is, um, the way that a media campaign may work is not by affecting um, individuals um, who learn, see those messages and learn them, but rather uh, uh, through the process of getting schools to uh, uh, change what they do uh, by introducing anti-drug campaigns into schools, is one example, or uh, changing, getting rid, of, getting rid of vending machines we were talking about this morning. Uh, uh, we were talking about this morning uh, from a, um, a, a nutrition campaign. So it's not that people change their behavior, it's that schools change their behavior. So interested in institutional processes as well as individual effect processes. And the notion is that those effects are almost surely moderated uh, by the social networks, as I mentioned a moment ago, and the effects probably differ among subgroups. So we can't assume the effects are universal, but that they likely differ among subgroups. And, uh, and particularly for my colleagues, um, and I'm sure for some of you here, I'm actually not all that interested in content. Um, I think that uh, exposure is what matters. Uh, now, I'm not saying that it doesn't matter at all what content is, but we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to modify the message, get it exactly right, get the arguments just right. And I spend some of my time doing that too. But deep down, I think that the, what matters is the sheer amount of exposure that people get to a, a broad class of messaging, broad content area. Um, rather than, and we spend too little time, to be honest, worrying about exposure. We worry much more about the shape of the message. Uh, and I think that's probably a, an issue. So all those things are in my mind as I go forward trying to think about it, how to study effects. So there are really two large categories of, of effects research that I've done. One, which will actually I refer to some, um, are the effects of large-scale deliberate interventions. I, as I said, I've spent much of my career looking at big, big 